Hi all, I have another notable game to show you today. Quite exciting. It's from Evgeny Elinovich, Elinovich Svechnikov. Now Svechnikov uh, did an opening system which I fell in love with literally when I was a junior player. Uh, I had these Epson printer printouts basically uh, <laughs> around my room at the time for Svechnikov positions. I thought it sounded good and it was like a really aggressive variation of the Sicilian defense. Uh, so I thought, yeah, today let's have a look at a notable game for Svechnikov using the actual, his his named opening, the opening that got named after him. Uh, basically, it was previously called the Sicilian Pelican. And when he did a book, actually, he modestly called it the Sicilian Pelican. Okay, so who is Svechnikov? Evgeny Elunovich Svechnikov, born uh, February 11th, 1950, is a Latvian, former Soviet international grandmaster of chess and a chess writer. As a player, he played his first USSR chess championship when he was just 17 years old, became an IM in 1975 and a GM in 1977. In earliest international competition, he was joint winner at Dessin 1974, shared first place with Polgiewski at Sochi 1976, and won category 8 tournaments at La Havre 1977 and Suem Fugus 1979. At Novi Sad in 1979, he shared second prize with Geller uh, behind Florin Georgiou. At Wikensi in 1981, he shared third place, and in 1983 was joint champion of Moscow. In team chess, he was selected as a reserve for the Soviet side, participating at the Moscow 1977 European Team Chess Championship. And although only an IM at the time, he registered an 80% score, winning individual and team gold medals. Representing Latvia at the Chess Olympiads in 2004 and 2006, he only lost twice in 22 games. Okay, so a fantastic player. You can read more on Wiki. He also had some ideas about players not handing in the score sheets. He, he thought you know they should they should use their intellectual kind of uh, creativity to to write their own like books on their games later and not have to hand over their their content really. It's, it's very interesting stuff. It's it's on Wiki if you want to check out that page on Wiki. So here let's have a look at 1978. Geller playing white against Svechnikov. E4, so Svechnikov plays the Sicilian defense and his variation basically. Knight C6. So you play Knight C6 here and you invite D4. And now Knight F6. For a long time, I thought E5 was Svechnikov. This is um, what I consider now a kind of poor relative, actually, E5. It gives White a bit too many options. Uh, White doesn't have to play Knight C3. The, the precise move order is actually to play Knight F6 here. Uh, so, yeah, this this is the precise move order. You might wonder why. Well, it forces knight c3 basically to defend the pawn to block this pawn. Uh, so this is the, the really the good move order. Knight c3 and now e5. Otherwise, it's I think it's called Kalashnikov if it's e5 early. So knight db5, d6. So black has conceded a strategic hole, and. I think after a while I got fed up with this hole on d5 and big knights on d5 and kind of gave up the system for quite a while. And maybe occasionally, you know, I, I play it only occasionally. But also there are, there are tons of anti-Sicilian systems. So the probability of getting it is actually quite low, even if you do try and play Sicilian. So here, bishop g5, a6, this is Welsh on territory. The knight is often trying to reroute to influence the d5 square with this kind of stuff going on, this rerouting maneuver. We have here b5 threatening b4, so knight d5 getting out of that. And now here there's a major junction for either, uh, in this position, knight takes e7 or bishop takes f6. Pardon me, actually also in, in this position there's a major junction as well. Instead of knight d5, you can play white can play bishop takes f6 immediately, basically doubling black's pawns. So this position with the double pawns, but it's been shown to give black a lot of uh, counterplay. So I think the preferred method nowadays, if you look overall at live book, knight d5 has been creeping up in popularity and maybe the most recent popular trend actually, rather than bishop takes f6. 
Uh, so I think this is like the Karpov wave. Karpov's playing against, against Sveshnikov. It's, it's keeping a bind on the position without giving black too much potential counterplay. Now bishop takes f6. So white is not going for the double pawns. He's just basically trying to emphasize his d5 grip. Uh, and now we get this maneuver c3 to facilitate this kind of thing. Black has the dark square bishop though. In the other variation, he also has that g-file pressure potentially. But here, the dark square bishop could be a bit useful. Uh, castles, knight c2, and bishop g5 getting out of the way of the f-pawn. Another problem though that that black has is his pawn structure here is slightly loose. It's attacked. And this gives white some key light squares as well as pressure on that a pawn. We have a5 now. Okay, so now bishop c4, rook b8, b3. And now Sveshnikov plays king h8, trying to get out of the way of this diagonal for f5. White castles, f5. Yes, and you may wonder why any players of black would like to play this position. And it's really a good question, actually. Uh, I actually mentioned when I did a video with Daniel King about the Svenshikov, and actually he said he used to play uh, the Svenshikov, but then he grew up and started playing the Neidorf. And I think I understand that because there's such a clear downside here. And it's, it starts to grate on you, these gigantic knights and occupation of d5. It's, it's like giving up a major central square. And in this variation, for what? You haven't actually got the g-file pressure. It's, it's the annoying variation where you've got the dark square bishop, but it seems like an awkward piece in this position. It's like hitting thin air. Okay, black tries to drum up counterplay. And this is an interesting example of, of what can happen. Uh, it's not just the f file. When, when white takes now, he doesn't really want to weaken his dark squares even more. So he takes. But also, we have a potential liberated pawn if white's not going to firmly blockade on e4. So bishop takes f5. Queen e2. Okay, queen d7. And now knight c e3. So it does seem like a strangulation on d5. Bishop e6. Rook d1. It's not for the faint-hearted. This opening, it's like, yes, <laughs> this is this is the kind of position you have to get used to and try to work work your way around. Um, bishop d8, rook a2. Okay, here a nice transfer though. Queen f7. The queen has some possibilities from f7 as well as putting some pressure on f2. We have here queen d3. And now queen h5, which looks at the rook actually, and white's next move has a bit of a weakness of the last move. He actually plays knight f1, which, which kind of, can you see the weakness of the last move? Although it's tempting to play knight g3, there's something which is, this move kind of introduces, which lets black almost get equality. I say almost get equality. Yes, it's a difficult position for black because of this beautiful knight on d5. Basically, you know, Geller's a really good player. He's he's got a very good record against F Fisher. You don't want to mess around against FM F F F M Geller. And uh, here, though, there is a slight weakness of the last move of Knight F1. Can you see what Black can play now? If I give you five seconds, you might want to pause the video. Okay, e4. It's trying to deflect the queen away from the rook. It's afforded by that knight f1 because the knight was actually protecting d1. It's a slight slip up and it shows actually how rapidly uh, black can get some counterplay sometimes if white's not careful. So queen c2. And now, you know, white starts to be hit with, uh, with another forcing move. Uh, so bishop h4 looking at f2. And this is a little bit awkward now. This is starting to be, uh, you know, not so, not 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 so pleasant, shall we say? What does White actually do to defend f2 here? Well, in the game, White played knight g3, and here 
we do have a position where with this pawn on e4 and there's no knight on f3 that actually after bishop takes g3 all of a sudden now after hg look at this knight e5 with a threat of knight g4 and queen h2 black is building significant threats in this position however knight f4 now seems to be a double attack on the queen and the bishop so black is forced to play basically in this position uh, rook takes f4 now after g takes black plays now knight f3 check so very aggressive stuff g takes is played and now bishop takes c4 and it's pretty dangerous actually this position for white uh with with the potential for the e takes f3 this is going to be extremely dangerous so white actually wisely didn't take the bishop here he actually tried to get rid of black's attack with queen takes e4 so he still like the exchange up in this position we have bishop takes b3 rook b1 it seems black's in in an awkward pin here but he gets out of that with rook e8 attacking the queen but white tries to be really clever here um well it is it is quite a dangerous position in any case white has to be uh well white has to be very very careful here he's got the rook hanging he's got the queen queen attacked he plays rook takes a5 and it's a, it's quite an amusing tactical position for, for the back row issue that black has and the number of pieces attacked here like how many pieces are attacked they're all looking at each other like um it's like a, it's a mexican standoff that's not looking at anything but uh there's quite a lot of pieces looking at each other here in this position so what does black do here well <laughs> he plays uh black to play well what what does he want to do um black doesn't want to take the queen because then rook takes h5 right why is the exchange up that's that's kind of even worse no not even worse check there's rookie a no you just take the queen here exchange up so what does he want to do he plays actually d5 he's trying to nudge that queen away and white plays a move which is fairly catastrophic actually he didn't actually need to lose from this position uh being objectively uh objectively speaking why well, didn't need to uh lose there's, there's a number of moves in this position at move 34 which uh, should be okay for white and i'll run over them i'll run through them quickly but first let's let's finish this game so in this position white played a catastrophic blunder in fact if i give you five seconds can you can you predict white's catastrophic blunder in this position so five seconds starting from now white play maybe yes one of one of geller's amazing blunders which otherwise it looks like a like a refutation of black's play in fact okay geller played rook e1 and it looks almost like a refutation of white's play because if it's encouraging d takes then rook takes yes and and that's the end of black and with rook e1 you know queen takes is threatened uh so that's pretty nasty if the rook moves then then that's it right we're still like the exchange up it's it's not good white's the exchange up but there's a move here which is really good and and rook takes e4 fails to a back row tactic rook a8 check so if rook we take and we're back row mating here the bishop's no longer got access to g here after that d5 but there's a move here which wins for black which is queen g6 well, yes i've highlighted it here queen g6 it wins for black queen g6 check 
and this is it white has to resign because do you see why on queen takes g6 instead of the ordinary recapture we can take here with check and then we can sort out the back row importantly with hg giving the king h7 so this is not mates because there's king h7 so queen g6 just just wins on the spot it refutes rook e1 yes <laughs> this this is a killer check and it also helps black's king safety as well I know it's not a convincing game, but it's it is an example of the Sveshnikov and a kind of realistic example that you have to somehow get some tactical counterplay because strategically it's like like you're in a lost position at the opening. I, you know, basically, if, if um, Vladimir Kramnik did play the Sveshnikov a bit, he had a loss against Kasparov, and I think that put him off. But uh, there have been some major exponents of the system. But, uh, you know, it, it can produce fantastic r results in practice. But you have to be aware that, you know, from a positional perspective, it's it's not the most mature um, opening. Now, basically, instead of this 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 move rookie one, let's just check this with a kibitza. This position here had a number of moves. Uh, you know, why is the exchange up? He shouldn't be necessarily losing this position, but he's not actually better. On the bright side of things um apparently if queen d3 bishop c4 now this is this is like dangerous for cutting the king off here queen takes f3 now black should have at least a draw here apparently after bishop d3 this this should be like drawish uh there's lines here where Black basically is grabbing a perpetual check in these lines because uh, if the king ever, like, well, there's there's check here. So black's grabbing a draw there after, say, a move like queen d3. Uh, but also queen takes e8 is also like drawing if white wanted the draw. But, you know, he was the exchange up, so maybe he just felt uh, this This apparently, from an engine perspective, is, is uh, should, should be just equal because uh, white's got the two rooks queen uh d3 queen e5 even this one which looks interesting this this position here should be uh, apparently equal because if the bishop moves there's a back row issue so basically uh black just keeps up the checks yes so gala was maybe a bit excited at this refutation type looking move and i know recently yes if emotions get you then that can affect um, precise judgment calls. So rookie one, yes, major blunder here, refuted with queen g6 check. This actually gives black a winning position, queen g6 check. Taking the queen, able to take the queen safely and able to play rook takes e1 check on queen takes g6. An interesting game, uh, you know, not, not an immortal game. It's just, it's just a notably interesting game really. But uh, even more interesting, you know, I, I think Sveshnikov that he had the guts to uh, revitalize a really uh, positionally suspect opening, but he had great results with it. You've got to be very, very tactically resourceful to play this sort of thing, uh, because positionally speaking, that when you get these huge knights on d5, you know, light square binds. Uh, you've got to be able to fight very very tactically often using forcing sequences often knowing the right time to to use your dark square bishop if it's at all possible to try and create opportunities to attack the opponent's king so you try and find any possible upsides of, of this very very double-edged opening okay comments or questions on youtube thanks very much